All right, well, we're going to get started. If a couple more people want to in, that's perfectly fine. And uh, this particular talk is, as it says, site builders, let's clean up our UIs. And this is really, um, first I'll start by telling you a little bit about me. I work with the Cherry Hill Company. We work with a lot of libraries primarily. We also work with nonprofits, NGOs. And so our range of clients and the people who use the products that we build is very diverse in terms of skill level. So some of our clients might be people who really, uh, you know, they rely on their kids to help them with Facebook. And that's, and that's very true and that's very legitimate. Some of our clients are incredibly skilled and they go in and do a lot of the site building themselves. And that's great also. So we need to make sure as we're building sites that the sites that we build for the people who are going to be maintaining the site on a day-to-day -day basis is actually one that they can use. I also want to just make sure that everyone knows that I'm a little bit loopy because I'm um, mostly focused on my belly right now, which is quite large. Um, so if, I, if I'm confusing, please forgive me, ask a question, and we'll clear that up. Uh, so the primary reason why I wanted to present this particular talk is because we as the Drupal community are responsible for making Drupal look good. I'd like to see a show of hands if there's anyone in the room who's heard people say, you know, I'd love to use Drupal or I think that uh, my company would really benefit from Drupal, but we really can't use Drupal because it's not easy enough, so we're going to use WordPress. Uh-huh. Okay, there is no reason for that because the beauty of Drupal is that Drupal is 100% customizable. So it's up to us, the people who build these sites, to make sure that what we deliver to the end user, and in this case I'm not talking about the person who the anonymous individual who comes to the site to see whatever's being offered on the site. I'm talking about the people who have to maintain that site on a day-to-day -day basis. It's up to us to make sure that the site that we give them is one that they find easy to use. And I have had plenty of those individuals that I described as individuals who rely on their children to help them with Facebook find their Drupal sites easy enough for them to use, that they're happy and they're able to keep their content up to date. It's entirely possible. And that's why Drupal is amazing. So there's no reason why we should look bad in, in relation to WordPress in terms of usability, except in terms of how much attention to detail we put in as we go through what we build. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, who's read Don't Make Me Think, a common sense approach to web usability. Great. Okay, so this is, this is a fun book. It's an easy read. You can read it on a short plane flight up to Portland from here. It's, it's very, very quick, easy book to read. And the golden rule that he puts out there is get rid of half of the words on the page and then get rid of half of what's left. This rule seems to be about content, but it's not just relevant to content. It's also very relevant to the usability that you're creating on your site. It's relevant to things like the text that you use in menus when you're creating menus for your site administrators. Um, it's relevant to how many links are on the page. It's relevant to the options that you provide for your user. And we're going to look at some of those things that by default out of the box look pretty messy. Again, not because Drupal's hard or because it's, uh, it's overwhelming, but because it's customizable. So out of the box, it might not be as friendly right from the get-go. And it's just a matter of us making that happen. All right, so what we're going to cover, we're going to cover the common UI pitfalls. We probably won't cover all of them because there's not really enough time. Um, and I want to get some feedback from you guys as well. Uh, we're also going to cover easy ways to mitigate those pitfalls. And uh, we're going to talk about the best time to make these improvements to the UI as you're, as you're going along. So the first thing that I want to start with is just to see if anyone in this room is willing to volunteer some of the common pitfalls that you experience, either pitfalls that your clients have said to you 
things that you've heard, or if you're a content manager yourself, things that you've had to deal with. Yeah. I think the very first pitfall, if you will, that happened um, when we got our first site built was for Drupal by a vendor, was everybody asked, where's the image library? Okay, that's a good one, and that's one that we'll sort of cover a little bit. There's not really enough time. That should be its own day of stuff. But So the, the pitfall I'll mention here is that when you get your site built by a vendor and then you're trying to figure out how to deal with images, where's the image library? Where do you access those images from? That's, that's a good one. Yes? Cut and paste. Cut and paste. Okay. That's um, somewhat unsolvable, but there are sort of ways that you can work with that. So cut and paste is definitely a pitfall. Yes? Yeah, which is very much related. So copy paste from Microsoft Word documents, uh, very much related to cut and paste. Any WYSIWYG um, or any any WYSIWYG, even even another web page copy paste from another web page can create issues. That is true. Yes. Anything else? Yeah. Formatting a table. For <laughs> okay, formatting a table. I laugh because that's one. Um, our technique there, uh, or tactic, I guess you could say, is usually to try to convince people not to use tables. And the main reason for that is because tables, by default, are not responsive. And we're moving into a world where we want our websites to be responsive. Um, now, it's not true to say that tables cannot be responsive, but that's also an entire session by itself and not one that we're going to talk about here. Um, it is possible to make tables responsive. It's just a, an extra work. But yes, how to format tables, that's definitely a common one. Um, all right, so the, the ones that I picked out are information overload. I think that's the biggest pitfall with Drupal. When I sit with, uh, with clients, people that I'm training, and try to show them how to use the site that they're now faced with maintaining, there's just too much on the screen. And they don't really know where to start. And so that's, that's one of the big ones. Um, blocks. The block system is really important to Drupal, especially if it's not a really fancy site that's going into the panels direction and, uh, and you're just creating something very simple. The block system is really important and cool and useful. And for those of us who speak Drupal every day and dream about Drupal, it makes perfect sense. But to the rest of the world, the block system is a mess. It's very confusing. Messy node forms. This is the thing that I see most often from sites that I inherit or that Cherry Hill inherits from, uh, from other vendors or usually from you know, the, the person who wanted to learn Drupal and built a site for somebody and didn't really know what they were doing. And then now that company or, or individual has to take care of that site. Um, messy node forms, they're just very confusing for people. And in there is page formatting, which, it, which comes to copy and paste. It comes to tables. It comes to anything involving photos or images. And um, it also comes to linking to other content. Uh, being a web developer myself, I always thought of linking to other content as being a very easy thing to do. But it turns out, if you actually sit down with somebody who's not a web person, uh, and doesn't use the internet on a, on a frequent basis, it turns out that linking to other content is one of the more challenging things for people to do. Uh, kind of a surprising discovery that you really only get through training people. Um, and views inconsistencies. We probably won't have time to talk about views inconsistencies, but when you're building your views, being really consistent in how your views are built so that it just makes sense, so that the way that the site operates the way that the content displays makes sense because it's going to be uniform whatever decisions you've made. So those are the ones that, um, that I picked out and I just lost my place here but I can get it back very quickly. Um, all right, so let's start with information overload. And the biggest thing that happens with information overload is permissions. This is a really, really, really easy thing for us to fix because Drupal has a great you know, user roles um, set up. It has great permissions functionality. Everything drills down to very specific, you know, well-built contributed modules. The various things that you can do in each of those modules have permission settings with them, within them. If you're building your own modules, it's not difficult for you to build in the ability to actually control permissions at varying levels. 
So permissions, this is where you can get sites that are incredibly difficult for people to use because there's just too much that they're able to do. And incredibly easy for them to break because you've given them access to something that they don't know or understand. And if you give them access to something, they will use it. <laughs> this I have learned the hard way as well. If they can find it in the menu, then they assume that maybe it's something they're supposed to use and they'll do it. And that's not good um, sometimes. Sometimes it is. Uh, all right, so I'm going to head over here to a site um, just to talk about permissions a little bit and show easy ways to deal with this. So this is a, a site that has many different levels of user role. It has a, um, the site admin user role, of course, which has permissions to everything. And then it has a librarian user role, which is for the librarians who are supposed to be able to control large quantities of the site, but not everything. And then it has specific user roles for those individuals who are only supposed to be able to edit the teen section or the kids section or content from a specific branch. So the only thing that's done here is to just be very careful about what level, what permissions those different user roles actually have access to. Now I will admit that we're also using the work, workbench moderation and access modules in this, but and those are a little bit more complex and wonderful things to definitely look into. Um, but on a simple level, if you come to the site as an admin, you get you know you have all these all these controls here, you have a menu, this using admin menu, um, you have all these kind of options, there's a lot here, and your user could very easily, you know, get here to context, and now they don't know the first thing about what to do with this page, this is just going to be an incredibly scary set of options for them, and if they touch it, they might very well hurt something in the site. So the easy solution here, I'm just going to go to, um, let's see if I can remember a, a URL. Yeah, we'll just go here. That's fine. All right, so the easy solution here is to just make sure that the permission settings are specific. So I'm just going to masquerade as a librarian user. And it's taking a little bit longer than I wanted it to, but what will happen once it eventually gets there is that a lot of the options that you see in the admin menu up at the top are going to go away. Only the things that this particular type of user role needs to be able to do are going to be available. However, there are still a lot of options. The, you know, if, if they mouse over any of the menus or the blocks, they will be able to edit those blocks. Notice, however, this is a view, and I don't get the view control here because this particular user is not allowed to edit views in order to keep those, those views safe from this type of user. So that's, um, that's a very, again, low-hanging fruit. And then I could drill down even further, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to. I could drill down even further to show you that you know, someone who's from the Northwest Regional Branch can only edit stuff that's related to the Northwest Regional Branch, and that's also done through permissions. Very, very easy way to help information overload. Another really easy way to help with information overload, again, very, very simple, quick way to do it, would be to create custom menus for your users. Or if you're using the default menu system, this is, again, this is admin menu, which we tend to prefer, but uh, the default menu system also has shortcuts, so you can take advantage of the shortcuts in the menu system as well. But what we've done here, this is, this is actually a... Um, uh, an Islandora project, which is Digital Asset Management System. And if we go into any of these collections, we're pulling up all of the Islandora data. Islandora is, from a usability standpoint, Islandora is amazing, but from a usability standpoint, it's very complex. So, you know, if, if I wanted to tell um, our content editors, okay, now it's time for you to go in and add your records to this particular project, they would have trouble, you know, they'd have to go into Islandora, they'd have to figure out which of these options, and you can, um, I got too big there, you can see, you know, like, how do they know what to click on? None of this makes any sense. So the easy and quick solution, again, you know, you always have to consider both your user 
and you have to consider the budget when you think of the solutions. So the easy quick solution that we did was just to create this little menu here on the on the right for them that this is this is what they're going to do on a daily basis. They're going to add a record, they're going to add a page, they're going to add a slide. They might add a form. They're going to review their inactive records and they're going to manage other content. That's all they're going to do. So they have this little tiny menu. It gets them where they need to go. They don't have to think. They don't have to look through the admin menu, so we don't even have to give it to them because they're never going to need to go in there. Very simple and, and doesn't really, it doesn't take much development time. Really quick to do. So that's another way to help with information overload. Just give people the key thing that they need. And it takes a little bit of thinking, but once you know what is the key thing that this person needs based on what they do, what they want to do, and their skill level, also something to always consider because every individual is different, then you can, then you can make that work. And one thing I did want to mention and then and forgot to is that I'm not actually talking about, in, in this particular talk, I'm not talking about two kind of controversial hot topics for usability. One of them being the difference between admin menu and the default Drupal menu. Um, and also we can look at the Drupal 8 default menu, which, you know, is adding some improvements to the Drupal 7 default menu. Um, so some people love the default menu, some people love admin menu. That's really, it's going to depend on your user, what they want to do. You know, is that person going to be more comfortable with hovers? Um, hovers are the bane of a lot of people's existence. A lot of us who do UI stuff, we hate hover menus, and we are sad when clients want us to build them in. Uh, but they, but some people find them more usable. So if that's the case for your client, then who cares what you believe? Because if your client's the one who has to do the work, then it's what's easiest for them that matters. You know, if whoever is going to have to do that work later changes, then you might need to shift to what's easiest for that person. The other big debate with Drupal 7 that Drupal 8 isn't, isn't doing anymore would be the overlays. Uh, this this kind of overlay system, which some people find to be a user experience nightmare. I personally happen to be one of those people. I hate overlays. However, these are very useful for some people. So again, when it comes to the individual who has to do the work, that's more important than your personal opinion. So for me, I wouldn't build an overlay, but for somebody else, I might. And I might leave this on, depending on what they're doing. Um, I also would probably leave the overlays on if I were building a site for somebody who was going to take it over for themselves and wanted to learn Drupal uh, and was very new to Drupal because it is kind of a nice, quick, easy way to get into stuff. Um, and if you're exploring for the first time and you don't really know Drupal, you're, you're learning it for the first time, the overlay is, is actually quite useful for that as a quick, okay, here's the window into what this is. And then eventually they're probably going to want to turn it off too. Um, and that's, that's going to be up to them at that point. So those are some considerations with information overload. So let's talk about blocks. Um, a little bit behind on my time here. So, um, okay, so blocks. Again, they're, they're kind of wonderful on one level. Let me uh, come back into the slideshow here. So, oh, buried administration options. That was talking about giving people the simple menu if that's all that they need, if there's only a very specific set of things that they're going to do, kill all the other UI stuff and just give them that little menu. Um, okay, so blocks. Again, for those of us who speak Drupal, who love Drupal, blocks are very, they make sense. They're, they're perfectly logical. But for people who are new to Drupal or will never really learn Drupal but will just go in and, and edit the stuff that they need to on their site, blocks can be very difficult to get to and they can be difficult to edit, especially in Drupal 7. This is one area where Drupal 8 has, uh, has made some really nice improvements. So first of all, you've got the block. Um, let me actually unmasquerade and go back to full admin here. So the first issue that we have is we have the block world, which has all of these regions listed. And then it has all of these blocks, and they all have names. And this is a great example because 
Sonoma, uh, the site that you're looking at right now belongs to the Sonoma County Library, and the Sonoma County Library has some actually very skilled Drupal people on their, uh, on their staff who wanted to be able to build views, build their own blocks, place their own blocks. Um, so they've done that, and over, you know, since when we launched the site, there were really no blocks in the blocks admin because we did all of the critical stuff in context to make sure that it would be protected from whatever Sonoma decided to do. Again, because Sonoma is skilled, when you have a skilled client, you also have to consider, okay, because they're skilled, they're going to be going in and they could actually potentially break something. How do we mitigate that as best as possible while still giving them the level of access that they want? So there are ways to, to do that. So you can see they've added a ton of blocks. But now let's say uh, you know, the current children's librarian moves on to something else and a new children's librarian comes in and has to figure out which of these kids' blocks is the one that they want to edit. And that's not necessarily going to be easy for them to figure out in this, in this display. So, um, and then the other issue with, uh, with blocks in Drupal 7 is that there's really, I mean, you can put some formatting in there, you can allow for WYSIWYG, but it's really limited what you can do in terms of controlling how the block structure is created to make sure that users, uh, you know, put stuff into the right fields and that the formatting ends up looking nice. So blocks can end up looking really messy really quickly. And that happens with even very skilled and conscientious clients. Um, Drupal 8 is nice because you actually get to set up your blocks and, um, oh, you know, it's in block layout. You can actually create block layouts the way that you can create content types, which is kind of neat because then you can say, okay, if they want to do, you know, a block that just has a PayPal script in it, here's the type of block that they would use. But if they want to do a block with an image and some cool stuff in it, use this block so that you can really control what they're going to, um, how that's going to look for them and make sure that the block is a little bit easier to edit. But that's coming in Drupal 8. Drupal 8's not here yet, so we're still, we're still dealing with Drupal 7 for production sites. Um, so that's, that's one of the challenges, one of the really big challenges with blocks. Um, so one of the easy solutions to this is contextual links, which are these little things that if you mouse over something, you get this little, the little gear, and then you can configure the block, or if it's a menu, you can, oh, that's not a menu, this is, you can edit the menu. So just making sure that this is enabled. This is a, this is now in core, contextual links is in core, and, uh, and so you just enable it or not in Drupal 7. In Drupal 8, it's, it's there right from the get-go. Let's go back to the site here. And if you mouse over, oops, I have this enabled right now. If you mouse over something, you'll get the little contextual link gear. You can do whatever you should be able to do with something. The nice thing here, though, is that up in the top right corner, there's also that little thing that you can click on, and it'll actually show you everything that's editable on the page, which is nice. Sometimes it's nice for people to just get that quick look. Oh, what can I actually edit here versus what, what can't I touch? Sometimes people can't tell what they can touch and what they can't. All right, so, um, so Drupal 8 has made some nice, some nice inloads. Now, the thing about contextual links and having that enabled is that I would say that that's one of those nice things to have enabled for people so that they know what they can, you know, so that they can get to that quickly or not. And that goes back to reading your client, understanding the individual and their skills. Sometimes you may not want them touching the, um, you may not want them touching the content or um, of a block. You may not want them to be able to get into things at particular points in time. So that's a, that's a consideration as well. In library site, for example, this is a, uh, something that Cherry Hill offers to libraries. By default, contextual links are only enabled for the site admin, for us. When the librarian gets the site, the contextual links are disabled because we actually don't want them playing with the blocks until we know that they've had a certain amount of training. The only thing that we want them doing is editing the content on the page. Until, again, until we know that they've had a certain amount of training and that they have a certain amount of confidence. And that goes back to information overload. 
Um, all right, so if you're not using contextual links, but there are blocks that somebody may need to edit, then the recommendation that we have there is to not rely on them having to go to structure blocks, because once they get there, they're going to be confused. This is kind of a, a hack, but it works. It's very easy for you to put a little block underneath a block that says, edit this block and make that block only visible to those users that have a certain user role and should be able to edit that block. I personally have no qualms with doing little things like that to make the, the tool more user friendly for somebody if it's going to make the difference between whether or not they're frustrated, whether or not they make a mistake. It doesn't matter that it's not an elegant solution. Now, a more elegant solution to that would be to go into your theme and then actually make sure that that block put that little edit link in there for the user if the user were of a certain role. That's the, that requires more skill with Drupal, so it, and it may require more time depending on what your theme is going to look like. So that all depends on, again, what your budget is and what your client actually needs and how much time you have. But offer the solutions without worrying too much about whether or not it's the best way to do it because what's more important is that they're able to do things easily and, and be happy. Oh, all right. So the next, the next big thing would be that um, the UI is confusing for blocks, which we actually already talked about. So in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of bypass that really quickly. Are there any questions at this point? We'll continue on. Chunk. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so contextual links, any, anytime we mention a module, it means that it's going to be in the modules um, world. So contextual links is one of the modules that's in here. Um, this actually, I'm glad you asked that because this takes us over to another very quick UI improvement that you can make for your users. Uh, the mod, a lot of the uh, administration interfaces by default can be kind of overwhelming. Um, you'll, if you played with Drupal and looked at the modules page, you'll notice that this looks a little bit different because it has this filter at the top. And this is using a module called Module Filter. And it makes, it just gives you the option to actually find modules more easily. So, um, so we're going to look for the contextual links module, which is right here. So I just went over to the modules admin page. As a user, if you have access to it, then you can get there. Again, it's part of core. You don't need to download it. So it'll be there. So you'll just check it, make sure it's checked, and then you'll save the configuration, and then that module will be there. And the layout of this modules page that you're looking at right now is the way that it is because a module filter, by default, it'll look like this. So it won't have that little search bar up at the top to quickly get you to a specific module. Yeah, any other questions at this point? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So the, the point that was just made is um, permissions also need to be set for contextual links, which is true. So if we go under people and permissions, um, and then I'm gonna jump down there. Contextual links does have its own permission set. So as I mentioned, the librarian user on default library site doesn't have the ability to look at contextual links because we don't really want them getting into that until we know that they're comfortable with, with editing blocks and what blocks do. Um, so you can set the permissions under people permissions. You can set the permissions for contextual links to see who sees them. As the site administrator, they're pretty much always handy because you know what's going on and the information overload isn't as relevant. But as a content editor, it definitely is. All right, so the block, um, the block world, very confusing UI. Uh, one of the ways that, that that can be mitigated fairly easily, depending on your skill level or the budget or time, is if you use the context module to place, or if you use panels, to place your, your blocks and your page components into the, the layout that you want. And then you don't need to list your blocks. Um, oh, wrong. 
you don't need to actually have the blocks listed on this page where you get this overwhelming list of blocks. That way, your user, your end user, who's going to probably want to make their own blocks, can actually only see the blocks that they've created here so that they can, kind of, in, under disabled, they'll all be visible, but within their various regions, they can actually see, okay, this is my block, this is the one I created, and I know what it is. And they won't get confused and start to work with one of those kind of site-critical blocks that really shouldn't be touched by them. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind about um, the other thing to keep in mind is if you are going to have to give your client access to blocks and if it is something that they're going to be using and they're not really comfortable with the block world, it's a good idea to offer them a cheat sheet and I'll just give you a sense of what we've over time realized needed to be in that cheat sheet. So the first thing we need to do is explain what blocks are so that people can actually visually identify them. And then talking about how to edit the blocks and then showing them where those little contextual links are if they have access to it. Sometimes they don't. It depends on what you set. There's all kinds of options on how blocks are configured, so making sure that they know what those mean. And then let me show you the key thing here is making sure that they understand what regions are and the regions on the site that's been created for them. This right here is probably the biggest area where they might get confused with blocks if they're having to place them on the page, is knowing what actually are these different spots on my page. And if I put a block somewhere, where will it actually show up? Um, so giving them that kind of cheat sheet that quickly shows them that is very helpful to them. All right, so messy node forms. This for me is, is one of the really big ones. And I'm just going to go straight in. I'll skip going back to the slideshow. Um, and I'm going to start with showing you library site. Yes. OK. So on library site, we have a, a content type. Well, we have a kind of a slideshow images option for users. And let me show you what this looks like um, if I go into the Teens section. At the top of the Teens page, there's a slideshow that the user can easily put stuff into. Now, this is just in the node to make it super easy for them. But it's also a lot of stuff. There's, there's a whole lot of information in here. So what we've done is we've put it into a field group very simple, we've collapsed the field group on the node form so that the user doesn't have to go through all of these slideshow images every time. Let's say they're working on a page that they've uploaded five slideshow images into. That would create a very long page before they get to the basic body area that they might edit. So that's something to consider, is if you have stuff that users may or may not use on a regular basis, or stuff that's going to just get huge and crowded, if you put it into a field group, then that can collapse it and get it out of the way until the user actually needs it. The other thing about, uh, about Drupal 7 that wasn't true in Drupal 6, in Drupal 6, your node forms, the, the form itself and then the display of the fields, so the order that the fields were in on the form, the order that the fields were in on the display were one and the same. In Drupal 7, those got disassociated from each other, so you could actually control them independently, which is both very fantastic and also not so great. On the fantastic side, it means that you can, you can really say, okay, this is the logical order that somebody needs to think, um, maybe this particular set of fields should be in a field group, even though they're going to display on different parts of the page. You can make those decisions, and you should make those decisions. This being one of those examples, the slideshow images being put into this collapsed field group. It's not in a collapsed field group on the display side. It just displays in, in this format that we've told it to display in. Um, so that's really fantastic. It gives you a lot of power there. The disadvantage is that a lot of times people won't think about it. They won't think about the node form and the order that those fields are placed in. And then they'll just give the, the client the, um, they'll give the client, okay, here's your, here's your node, 
here's your content type that you asked for, now fill it all in. They'll have thought about the display side, but then they won't match. There won't be any consistency or thought to that order. And so the client will get confused. They're like, well, okay, I'm putting content up here and it's displaying down here. I don't quite understand. It might take them a little while. And then they start to think, well, this is hard because now I have to make guesses as they're putting stuff in. Trust me, I've encountered this. It may sound hard to believe, but I've experienced this many times. So this is definitely something to think about. You should be thinking about the order of the fields in your node form. Very important. Uh, I'm going to skip widget choices. That's, uh, that's, well, I won't entirely skip it. I'll just mention it briefly. Pick out the widgets for your fields that really make sense for that field and for your client. Some of our clients love, I'll use the date field as an example, some of our clients absolutely love the pop-up of the calendar for putting in dates, and some of our clients hate it and they just want to type in the date. So understand your client and choose the widget that makes sense for them, because otherwise they're going to be frustrated. They're going to have to kind of deal with something that isn't what they want. Another thing to think about is to really only use long text with formatting when long text with formatting is actually something you want in that particular field. If a field shouldn't have formatting in it, then don't make the formatting option available to the person. That can be very problematic. So um, the, uh, the other really key thing that I want to mention here is you'll notice that there really isn't a lot of help text on this form. There's some of the default you know, text formats text, but for the most part, help text should definitely be used when it's needed, but only when it's truly needed. And if help text is needed on a field, then you, you need to consider, are there ways that I can make this field more clear with the field label or its placement or by collapsing it? Is there some way that I can get some of that text out of there so that the user can just do the form because, unfortunately, the reason for Steve Krug's rule, get rid of half the words on the page and then get rid of half of what's left, is because users don't read, period. Unless you tell them that they really have to. Then and tell them verbally, not, not tell them by saying, read this in bold at the top of the page, because that won't work. They won't have read that. But if you verbally tell them, look, this form is difficult. This, you've asked for some very complex things here. We had to make sure that the help text was in here. Then they will actually read, and that's perfectly legitimate. But if you don't do that, they won't read it. So figure out if you can get rid of it. And if you can't, if you truly can't, then make sure that the help text is as concise and helpful as it can possibly be. And anything that isn't helpful should go. Get, get rid of it. Um, all right, so page formatting. Um, all right, this is, this is a big one. WYSIWYGs are, how many people in here cringe when you hear the word WYSIWYG? It's okay to raise your hand. I hate WYSIWYGs. I absolutely hate them, but they're on every site that I've ever worked on, I think. I'm pretty sure. Because your end users more and more people don't know anything about markup. Five years ago, ten years ago, almost everybody who was doing anything internet-based was interested in markup, and they figured it out. And so that was great. But today, nobody wants to. They don't care because Facebook, Twitter, everything else out there has just made everything so dumbed down for them that, that they're not going to take the time to learn how to make something bold. I personally think it's really cool to make something bold myself, but that's, you know, whatever. <laughs> that's, um, that's just the way, the way that we're, we're headed. So WYSIWYGs are necessary because otherwise your end user, your, your person who has to maintain that content, will get confused. Now, I will say that occasionally, we do have clients that don't need the WYSIWYG, and we love those clients. We really do, because they, they can just run off and do what they want, and it tends to end up looking better at the end of the day. If you're going to create a WYSIWYG for someone, though, limit what they have options to. You'll notice that this is extremely limited. They can put an image in. 
Um, we've preset some styles that they can use, so we've created CSS for these styles, and we've put those in. We've made sure that they have access to the headers because they're probably going to need that. And we've given them the pasting from, it says paste from Word here, but really this is paste from anything. And what this does is attempt as best as it possibly can to get rid of all of the bad words that my baby won't want to hear. Um, stuff from whatever tool you're, you're using, because it will be in there. So using this, giving this to your client always will really help them in that, with that issue. It won't solve it completely, but it will help them. Since it won't solve it completely, the other thing to make sure that you train your client on, because the other side of this is also training your client, is you show them how to disable rich text so that they can actually get rid of that WYSIWYG and paste the content in without bringing all that nasty stuff over. I find that this, is, this tool is improving dramatically in the last, for, for maybe the last year and a half, I actually haven't had people really needing to disable rich text, which is pretty great. Um, so that's definitely an improvement over time. Yeah. It's not default. Uh, it's part of the settings. It is in this particular one that we're using is WYSIWYG with um, the tiny MCE library. And there's a lot of different tools out there. SCK Editor seems to be the one that the Drupal world is standardizing on. It's the one that's in Drupal 8. And um, it's just, again, what, which one you choose is going to depend on your client. It's going to depend on who you're working with and what they like. Uh, this one we find makes it very easy to be very restrictive as to what's there. So it is one of the advanced options that you can configure into the WYSIWYG. It's not there by default. Again, none of this is default. You have to configure it. A WYSIWYGs, when you set up a WYSIWYG, you do have to configure it. Otherwise, you're going to end up with something that's information overload. So the other thing that we've done here is we've realized that sometimes libraries need to include tables in their pages. We try to tell them not to but we know that sometimes they will need to. So we actually created a separate text format for that so that when they look at the WYSIWYG on a normal basis, they don't see all of the table options in there. They only see it if they make the conscientious choice that I need to put a table into this content. So here's, how I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this change, and now I'm going to have these other options available to me. This small thing has made a big difference in how people have actually interacted with their pages and how many tables we've seen on client sites. Uh, it's made a huge improvement. So uh, this is definitely a nice, a nice little trick to hide stuff. Um, and then the other thing to really make sure, again, I'm full admin right now, so I have access to full HTML. But no matter how skilled your client is, or especially if your client is really skilled, unless they absolutely need it, it's part of their requirements, do not give them access to full HTML because they will break their site. So if it's a requirement, well, then you have to do it. But if it's not, and, and you have to make sure that your, your backups are good. Um, but if it's not a requirement, don't give them that access. And don't give them access to PHP, again, unless it's absolutely a requirement and you know your backups are really good. And, um, you have good insurance, and no, just kidding. Um, so, so really, just keep it keep it as simple as you possibly can. Now, I mentioned internal links being a, a huge problem. We like this tool called Linkit, which also you know this requires a little bit of training, but we find that it does make it easier for people because um, and this is not default. This is a module that you have to download and add, and it allows for the user to search for content to grab a link, so then it grabs the URL and it actually grabs the node ID so that if the path changes, the link doesn't break, and it puts it in there, and then you, and then the user doesn't have to go hunting around and, and you know, know how to copy and paste from the URL bar, which sounds easy to everyone in this room, I'm sure, but it isn't, um, so <laughs> just something to keep in mind. So um, I am going to need to skip, um, I'll take one more minute here, and then I need to give you guys time for questions. Um, so I'm going to skip the views and consistencies. I do want to talk a little bit about images. 
Um, you can use IMCE is, is a pretty good tool. There's, it, it gives you the ability to have a file browser, which does give you access to a library. There's also the media module. So you know, if I click on something, it gives me access to a library. There is the media module as well. The media module is very nice because it does give you an image library that the user can use. And you're not going to use both. You'll use one or the other, IMC or media. And, um, and this one looks a little more old fashioned. It's probably better for clients like libraries where you have people who deal in data. Those people understand this kind of UI Whereas a younger, uh, you know, client who's like a, a, you know, just out of high school and is used to Facebook might understand just a, a grid of pictures more effectively. And that's a matter of just reading your audience. Do, have they dealt in data for the last 20 years or have they just been flooded with pretty images for the last 10 years? What is this person? How do they interact with stuff? And then figuring out what the tool is for them in that case. Now the other thing that we find with images is um, you've all probably used image styles for making your images look nice. And images, uh, image styles are great, but they'll crop the image based on whatever settings you've set. And sometimes that crop, in order to make that size, may not be the best. So let's imagine that this picture that I have here is actually a person's face, not a, uh, not a flower. And let's actually imagine that the flower were off to the side. So if it cropped to the middle, then the person's face would get lost, and that would be very problematic. So there's this little module that we've added in here called uh, Focal Point, I believe it's called. We put it into everything. I always forget what it's called. Yes, Focal Point. And you can say, treat this as the center of the image. So let's say I wanted the leaf to actually be the center of the image. I would say, this is what I want as the center of the image. And then when my image styles are created, it just pairs down to that particular point. And then there's a preview that allows you to see what that looks like in all of your styles, which can be very helpful as well. Um, all right, so that's really getting us to the end of our, our time here. So I'm just gonna come back to this and do a quick little recap here. It's, we've talked about all of these items and we're skipping views and consistency. So when to do all of this stuff? Well, um, I train Kung Fu and the other night, um, the Grandmaster asked us a question. When's the best time to solve a problem? And the answer is, the best time to solve a problem is before the problem exists. And that is incredibly true. Because once the problem exists, your client's unhappy. They're confused. They think Drupal's difficult. All right? So you don't want that to happen. You also want them to have confidence in you because you spent, you probably worked really hard on this. You built them something amazing. You don't want that one tiny little thing that's difficult for them to make them hate the entire thing because that can happen. It's sad, but it does happen. So this is the kind of stuff that you build in while you're building the content type. Don't wait until, you know, don't just go and build a bunch of content types and then go back and clean them up because you won't. I know this myself. You run out of time. You're, you run out of budget. You run it, you're, you're hitting a deadline. The client sees all the awesome stuff you've done and decides that they want you to do something else as well. That, that, you know, that scope creep that always comes up. And now you're off in another land and that content type, you've forgotten that you never went back and made sure that everything lined up the way that it should. It will happen. So you do it while you build. Not later, but while you build. And then any time you're looking at the site and you see something that might be a little bit frustrating to your end user, you go in and you fix it right then and there. And that, that's really the only way to do this. Otherwise, you're not going to do any of this because it'll be hard to go back. Um, I, you know, it's, I've seen it happen a lot where a site gets given to a client and the permissions haven't been set. And then you say, oh, yeah, here's this great feature for you. And then the client says, well, I can't find it because they can't because it's not there because they don't have the permission. So it happens. Don't let that happen to you. It will. It's okay. It will happen to you. But try not to let it happen to you. And the more diligent you are about trying not to let it happen to you, the less likely it is to happen. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to blend the your ideas and questions into one. Any, uh, anyone want to ask a question or add a, a thought here? Yeah. 
No, no, that's, uh, that's using field group. So when you're setting up your fields, you can, and I don't remember, is field group part of core or not? I, I'm seeing some nodding. I think it is, yeah. Yeah, when, once you build a billion sites, you don't remember which modules you actually had to add and which ones were, were there at the beginning. But yes? I'm just having a question because, um, you know, going through this process of enabling the module, configuring everything, and setting it all up, mm -hmm. these features and stuff like that that packages all the way from the infrastructure? Yes. So the question was, do we use features to package the content types and modules and configuration that we set up? And we do. Um, and I believe that there's actually a features talk that's happening either today or, or tomorrow. Um, if anybody knows when and where that is, please spew it out because features are unbelievably helpful in terms of deploying um, a bunch of, of new stuff that you're putting together. Um, tomorrow at 1.30. Tomorrow at 1.30, thank you. Thank you. Definitely go to that, to that presentation. Yeah. Anything else? Um, uh, where the node edit form, I, I started packaging things into vertical tabs, and we've mm -hmm. done that or done that. Yeah, vertical tabs. I actually used to I used to package stuff into vertical tabs a lot in Drupal six. Um, I haven't been doing that in Drupal seven because I find that the collapsing the field group tends to be a little bit more friendly for people. But that's just in my experience. Again, it's going to depend on who has to deal with the site. If you're the one dealing with the site, I think vertical tabs might be a lot easier because it, it's more of a Drupal way to do things. It makes more sense to us. Um, so I, I think that's really going to depend. Vertical tabs are great. I, I love them. <laughs> but I do find that some clients find them a little bit confusing because they're down at the bottom and they're just kind of all in, in, in their own little world and they have to click through them. So yeah, that's a good one though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, does anyone know the name off the top of your head of the? Node queue. Node queue is great. Node queue is great. There, there is, there is actually a module that allows you to, um, that it's a tag, a taggable view or, or order view or? Draggable. Draggable, thank you. Draggable views. Um, draggable views module will actually allow you to make the, the view draggable, like the, the nodes draggable for your user. Node queue is also an option, but Node queue does require a lot more configuration. Um, I love Node queue. It, it create basically you the user then says which items show up in the view and in which order, and then they can drag them. And it's separate from the whole view itself. It's it's its own interface. Um, it's a it's a great solution. Draggable views is probably the the more lightweight, user friendly way to do it. It's going to depend on what your user actually needs and the level of control that they need. If they need a lot of control, node queue is the way to go. Anything else? Uh, the, I'm also doing a views talk tomorrow, if you have more questions about views, and I'll make sure to bring up uh, node queue and draggable views in the talk tomorrow. I was waiting to make sure there was no questions, because okay. questions are way more important than suggestions. But um, one of the things that I came across, you know, again, having it delivered and not really knowing what to do with it and I found challenging right away was we had some content types where when you create that content type it will be some of the content is going to be accessible on a view as well as when you get into yeah. the detail of it and so there were two image uploads one for what you're going to see when it's displayed in the list and in the view and then when you actually open that content in detail and there was a separate image upload for each one which was really frustrating for somebody because they're doing bios, mm -hmm. and they just want to upload one image, so there was like no checkbox or anything, you know, we're talking about that whole UI friendly kind of thing, is right. they found it really frustrating if they had to upload the same exact image twice because they wanted to use the same image in the list as in the bio when you open it. Mm -hmm. So again, for that whole like suggestion box, if you're somebody who's going to create content types and you think you're running into that situation, you want to be able to allow them to use the file browser to choose the same file that they've already uploaded once or even just have a checkbox if you can manage that. Just say, just use the same image for both of these things yeah. and make them upload the same image twice. Yeah, so 
for the sake of the recording, the suggestion was to just make sure if, if you have a situation where somebody may need to use a different image um, or different content to make it in, in two places, let's say in, in a list view versus on the page, to make sure that it's easy for them to only have to upload that image one time or to give them a checkbox to say, I actually just want to use this, this one image for both fields, which reminds me of another really great little tool called Conditional Fields. And Conditional Fields is a module that you can add to your site that allows you, when you're building your forms, it also works in, with web form as well, so you, you, can, um, you can set conditions on your node forms and on your web forms to say, uh, you know, if the user checks this, then do all the, you know, create all these fields for them. If the user does that, then show them all these fields. And then you can actually even have required fields in there that won't be required if the user hasn't checked off something that conditionally makes that those fields available. So it can be a really great tool on Node Forms. I will say, however, that conditional fields should be uh, suggested with a huge caveat that sometimes there are some huge conflicts with the way that forms work once you introduce conditional fields. So sometimes conditional fields are not a good solution. But when things are very simple, they can be an incredibly helpful tool in making your form really user-friendly for people. For example, for Sonoma, uh, for the Sonoma County Library, uh, the event content type covers every kind of event, including a book discussion. But there's all kinds of information that they need to include if the event is a book discussion. But we don't want them to have to see all of that, all of those fields, if the event isn't a book discussion. So the condition says, if book discussion has been chosen as type of event, now show these like 10 other fields to the user that they then also have to fill out. And helps a lot, yeah. That's great, but then you don't have to create the 10 minute content. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So the point there was that that's helpful because then you don't have to create 10 or so different content types for everything. You just create one, the user gets used to one place to go do things, and it, and it all works the same way. So that's very... It is very helpful. Again, conditional fields use with caution, <laughs> but they can be a really helpful tool. Great. Well, I think it's lunchtime for everyone, so um, I, I believe lunch is happening. Does anyone know exactly where lunch is happening? I look to you, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, I think it's around, yeah. Pacific Ballroom? Excellent. Okay. So I should probably let everyone go and eat, and if you have question, more questions and want to come up, please <laughs>